Absolutely mesmerising today, thank you. I'm just going to go through a couple of questions. Um, how does the heart of someone on a poor diet differ from the heart of someone on a healthy diet? If somebody has a poor diet, will have a heart that shows signs of arteriosclerosis, which is basically hardening of the arteries as deposits of cholesterol and fat appear in the coronary arteries. Now we saw some of that earlier on today. If you've got a poor diet, then you have most likely a very high salt intake, either directly or indirectly through pro processed food. And the high salt intake can result in hypertension or high blood pressure, which uh, often translates to coronary artery diseases and with time the heart becomes bulky because it's having to push against uh, you know hard arteries and the rest of the body and that often can lead to heart failure. A poor diet often has high cholesterol and high fat and again that contributes directly to the cholesterol and fat deposits in the coronary arteries. Um, once again a poor diet often has high levels of sugar in it uh, and that's a, uh, again can give you impo impaired uh, glucose tolerance, um, can lead to early onset diabetes and diabetes is a huge risk factor for coronary artery disease and in fact cardiovascular disease in general. Two thirds of all diabetics at some point in their life will have some sort of cardiovascular disease either in the heart or neck arteries or the arteries in the kidneys or legs. Do you see any other internal signs of poor diet? Specifically to what I see, yes, well when you open the chest, uh, if you remember one of the first things I did was to lift the heart up and look at the targets. And, and especially in the last case that we did, for somebody who's 53, he had pretty awful, awful disease. Uh, the whole of the artery in the front of the heart was, was rock solid and, and I struggled to find a spot where I could put the graft on. And that was the same with his coronary artery on the right side. And in fact if we look back at the angiogram here, and that's, uh, you can see it here. Uh, this is the artery in the front of the heart and you see that it comes to a complete abrupt stop here. That artery is supposed to carry on all the way to the front here, but it comes to a complete abrupt stop. That tells me that, that you know, there's 100% occlusion. And at 53, it's quite shocking. And if, uh, if I scroll through to the right-sided uh, right coronary artery, you'll see it's the same again here. The dye injected into the right coronary artery comes to an abrupt stop here. There's absolutely nothing going further down. Okay, and in this gentleman, this is a combination of factors. He had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and he was a smoker. In fact, he's a current smoker, right up until the time of the operation. What are the first warning signs someone might experience if they're damaging their heart through poor diet? First warning signs range from those that are very dramatic to those that are very subtle. And starting with the dramatic ones first, first warning sign of anybody who's got cardiovascular disease because of a poor diet would be a fatal heart attack, their first and fatal heart attack. Fortunately for most of the people, the first warning sign are the subtle ones, increasing shortness of breath or increasing angina. Angina is cramp that one experiences in the chest as uh, you know demands are placed on the heart when they go up a flight of stairs or try and walk up a hill on a windy day and this usually a central crushing chest pain that goes into the jaw can go up and down the arm and is usually related to exercise. Which do you think is more important diet or exercise? I think both are equally important. Exercise is important to maintain your cardiovascular fitness and the best way to maintain your cardiovascular fitness is to eat a sensible and healthy diet. Can damage to the heart be reversed and if so, how long can it take? Well, generally as a rule, heart muscle does not regenerate. So if you've damaged your heart muscle as a result of a heart attack, it does become scar tissue and scar tissue doesn't contribute to any contraction. However, there is a phenomenon called heart uh, hibernation. Hibernation is when there is a chronically reduced blood supply to normal heart tissue and the heart tissue goes and sleeps, hibernates. But when you restore that blood supply back, for example, after coronary bypass surgery, then you can waken up these cells and they can start to contribute to its function. So yes, in that respect, you, you do get regeneration, but regeneration in terms of recruitment of, of existing cells that were in hibernation. Um, we've seen these changes happen fairly soon after coronary bypass surgery, but, but that muscle has to be hibernating and not scar tissue. Scar does not regenerate.
And within a matter of weeks, we've seen on echoes, patients' hearts start to function better than they were before the operation. Since your training as a surgeon since 1997, have you noticed an increase in younger patients requiring heart surgery? Barbara, the number of patients requiring heart surgery in general is on the increase. Although we're seeing a greater increase in the elderly because we're living longer, uh, we are also seeing very young patients appearing. Now, I've assisted during my training years in operations on people in their late, early 20s. Now, at that time, these patients had a genetic problem. They were had high levels of cholesterol because genetically they were predisposed or they had a family history of heart disease. But what I'm beginning to see more recently is, is an increasing proportion of patients who do not have genetic problems but are there because of high cholesterol, hypertension, high salt diet. And I'm pretty convinced that diet now is beginning to play a more and more important role. A few months ago I operated on patients in their 30s. And this is on, you know, these are patients younger than myself. It makes you wonder where things are going. And, and they had terrible disease. And in fact, the reason they presented themselves early is because they've got such terrible disease. And one wonders how long those grafts are going to stay open for if they don't, they don't want to address the risk factors. So yeah, although the general population is aging, we are doing older and older patients, there is a subset of patients that we're seeing who are presenting with very early disease. And again, modifiable risk factors, smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, poor diet. Do you ask cardiac patients to give you an example of a typical day's meals and snacks? And if so, what are some of the common foods? Well, thinking about this, we actually don't ask them for a proper food diary. But when you look at the patients that we're doing and what they're eating, perhaps it is a good idea to start asking them directly what they eat. We do get indirect answers because we ask them about hypertension, we ask them about diabetes, we ask them about high cholesterol which is all net effects of a poor diet anyway. But coming back to this, I think, you know, a food diary might be important for extreme, for especially the younger patients who come to you because you think that they're because of a poor diet and perhaps we need nutritional input. Well, for sure before, but then after the operation as part of your secondary prevention, I think it would be useful to have a nutritionist on board. Do you think the government should do more to educate us, like in the school curriculum, doctor surgery, leaflets they should give out like they did with the recent swine flu epidemic? Uh, Barbara, for sure. I think the government has a responsibility. But the biggest responsibility still lies with us, the patients. The government should use portals such as schools, surgeries and celebrities. Jamie Oliver has done a fantastic job in reinventing school dinners and increasing the food choice available, all of which are healthy but just as tasty. Some of the governments, such as the Australian government, has even gone a step further. Having learned lessons from America across, across the big pond, they've started to, or are thinking about, levying uh, taxes on junk food and such extreme measures. And I think this should be really the way forward, especially when you look at what we're, what's available in the supermarkets now and what choices we're making because of our, our, our busy lifestyle. Do you think that supermarkets should play a stronger part in encouraging us to eat healthily? I think it would be nice to see supermarkets take a corporate responsibility for what they market, actively discourage unhealthy choices while actively encouraging healthy choices. But we have to remember that supermarkets are a business and in this cutthroat climate they will do everything to make money. And You only have to look around to see that it's often the processed and, and the high salt, high fat diet which are often cheaper and more convenient. So yes, I think supermarkets should do it but they need to have a greater choice of healthy alternatives from the suppliers. I changed that bit. Great stuff. Okay. Raj, thank you so much for today. It was incredible and um, inspiring. I learned so much and it's really taught me probably to value my own health a lot more uh, and inspired me probably to take my own work life um, to another level, you know, with uh, how you worked as a team in there. But obviously my agenda um, is I'm really concerned about how food is marketed today as safe um, and healthy with the, current market, market, with the current marketing on packaging to children and parents. And um, when, you know, the, the latest studies are showing that it's addictive, unsafe and unhealthy. So 
Is that something that um, perhaps we can work to change? Or, and as a cardiac surgeon, does that concern you? Both, um, both in the operating theatre and also the economic factors that obviously if you know, cardiovascular surgery is on the incline, then the patients that are going to need your support and help professionally is, you know, if that's going to rise, how is that going to burden you and also the NHS? Well, Anthony, those are very valid points. Very much so. Um, certainly misleading or misinformation on food labels is a big concern. And it's the responsibility of the Food Standards Agency to make sure that food labels are presented very coherently and very clearly. As consumers, we tend to believe what's written on the label. So it's our responsibility to be even more critical and to look at every label before we buy everything. But again, what we're reading, what it means and everything, has to come from the food, st food Standards Agency. So really what you're saying is we need a new structure that is more honest, perhaps, and transparent that um, people can really understand because right now um, research is suggesting from parents that the um, marketing they're reading is very misleading. Yes, I mean it is misleading and as a parent here I struggle with the same thing. You know I have to go and make sure that my kids are not exposed to the E numbers and the preservatives and we do try our best to buy something that's fresh and organic but sometimes the definition of what's fresh and the definition of what's organic is variable. But if you look at the Food Standards Agency, they are trying very hard to, uh, to address this issue and trying hard also to make sure that there's a European-wide definition that fits organic and fresh and non-processed and, and so on and so forth. And I think we will get there. Not only is it our responsibility, but it's the responsibility of the government too to educate us on this. And they can do that once again through schools, through surgeries, through celebrities. Supermarkets can do this, end, you, end retailers can do this, suppliers can do this. So it's a corporate responsibility and everyone's respons responsibility to make sure that what they're selling us is exactly what it says on the label. Now the potential benefit of this on the NHS is huge. The financial implication is absolutely huge. Let's look at coronary bypass surgery. We do about 20,000 coronary bypass operations a year. Each one costs between 10 to 13,000 pounds. Now, if we manage to get this right, and if we manage to reduce the proportion of obese and morbidly obese patients coming through, it has a huge impact. We've already shown, the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons of, of Great Britain and Ireland has clearly shown that the morbidly obese patients are the ones that cost us more because they have more complications and they stay in hospital for much longer. So, could, if we don't get it right now, the generation of tomorrow could be um, suffering from cardiovascular disease well before the age of 40 years of age, is that right? Absolutely. Coming back to this patient that I operated on who was only 34 years of age, his he's, he's, disease was so bad that I struggled very hard to put, put grafts on, to find a suitable spot for grafting. And one wonders how long these grafts will stay for open for and what his options are in a few years time when those graphs get blocked if he doesn't look after his you know his diet and his cholesterol and so on and so forth and the options are probably a heart transplant and he's not going to live the years that were planned or the actuary and survival for a male in this country if he goes down that line we're going to see more and more of these patients come to us I think this could be linked either directly or indirectly to the way food's been marketed and these patients will, almost for sure, not have a normal life expectancy, I don't think. If there isn't a law to actually prevent foods being sold that are dangerous, or at least marketed, you know, the, the same as smoking, then um, I don't think it's really, um, it's not fair, because so, it's, it's, you know, it's quite generally misleading for, for people that want to live a safer life, but don't know the, the actual implications of some of the food they're eating. All I can say is that since 2001 we've reported in our society figures that the proportion of patients who are obese and those who are morbidly obese year on year has been increasing. And year on year these patients cost us more, they have more complications, they stay in hospital for longer. So if we can cut that proportion out, in these difficult times when our funding has been reduced dramatically, the NHS is getting less and less money to spend on patients, we should be looking at measures like this. Simple measures that you can undertake at home. And this is how we're going to save money in the future, at least one of the ways. Mm, perhaps even a way of measuring patients.